They both take their empty bags back to the airlock. Scott will go into the airlock first, followed by Dan. So at the end of the CVA, P6 is in transit, and Dan's next CVA will be in the stage with Peggy a few days after shuttle undocking. After EVA 2, the crew works on relocating P6 down to the port end of the truss, just shy of berthing it onto P5. The third spacewalk is performed on flight day 8 by Scott and Wheels, and it's expected to be a seven hour EVA. Let's roll the video for EVA 3. Again, we'll start by zooming in on the airlock quest. This time, Wheels will egress first, followed by Scott, which spreads the, spreads the experience of operating the hatch amongst the crew. After they come out of the hatch, they have a long way to travel to get down to P5 so they can assist with P6 installation. You can see P6 flashing all the way down the truss on the right. We'll fly the virtual reality simulator down there. And when we get there, you'll see that P6 is positioned just off of P5. In flight, it will be 130 centimeters out and two meters forward. Due to the decision to install the truss and the need to monitor the robotic clearances, the EVA crew is required for berthing cues to help the robotic operators with the fine details. As we fly up, you'll see Scott in the foreground at the Nader forward corner, and Wheels is in the aft zenith. The crew is going to flash here for a second. They'll give verbal, verbal guidance for berthing, and then Wheels will close the capture claw. After this, they'll go around to each corner and install the RTAS bolts in a specific sequence ending with a sequence using a torque wrench. And then they'll release the preload on the capture latch so that the bolts carry the primary load for the life of space station. The next major objective will be to apply power to P6 so it can be activated and its arrays can be redeployed. This is done with four umbilicals. So Scott begins mating the connectors from P5 to P6. As we fly around here, you'll be able to see the area they're working in that's going to be flashing. Scott's in a foot restraint due to the cable stiffness and the geometry in the area. Here's some video from the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory, so you can see the general work site. Wheels will come over at the end of the procedure to help Scott as required. Next, they'll go to the very tip of the newly installed truss element and take the shrouds off of the sequential shunt units. These are the same shrouds that were installed on EVA-1. They put these in a bag to bring inside, and then Wheels heads back to um, the lab to start working on the MBSU task. Scott stays behind and releases the cinches radiator so that it can be redeployed as part of the P6 activation steps. Once the cinches are released, the radiator will be deployed with a command from the ground. The radiator is deployed during a day pass, so it can be watched for any unusual movement or problems. Scott might or might not be in the area depending on his timing. Next, Scott heads back to the starboard truss. Between EVAs two and three, the ground sent commands to fire the cinches on the S1 outboard radiators, and these radiators should be deployed by this EVA, although it isn't shown that way in this video. Now that the radiator cinches have fired, Scott reconfigures the squib firing unit back to the way we found it by swapping a connector and cap. Then Scott will have some free time where he can perform some small get-aheads like bag moves and strap installations. And now back to what Wills has been doing since he last left Scott on P5. He sets up the shuttle robotic arm with an adapter and a foot restraint, and he gets onto that foot restraint over on the Nader lab. He might have to direct George and Stephanie, the arm drivers, with cues for moving the arm. Here you can see him coming into the upper part of the screen. They then fly wheels over to the shuttle payload bay on the starboard side to pick up the critical spare box called the main bus switching unit, MBSU. He drives one bolt to release it and then takes it back to space station via the shuttle arm. Scott's waiting for wheels to arrive so they can both install it on external stowage platform two. Wheels needs Scott's help because the arm can't quite reach for wheels to install it by himself. Here you can get a feel for the size of the box, which weighs 525 pounds. After that, wheels will take the foot restraint off of the shuttle arm, and they'll both come inside, Scott going into the airlock first. Right around this time, the first solar array will be redeploying on P6, 
so the day is still pretty busy for the IVA crew after the EVA. After EVA 3, the arrays should be deployed that same day, so the crew can get ready for their next EVA two days later. As you've heard, we might insert a spacewalk after EVA 3 for a towel repair test, but I'll talk about that one later. Next, I'll talk about the Peggy and Yuri EVA, uh, which is expected to be a six and a half hour EVA. So let's roll that video. Here you can see the P6 solar arrays, newly deployed on the far right hand side. On this EVA, Peggy will come out of the hatch first, followed by Yuri. They'll both make their way to the forward end of the lab. Peggy's operating on the left side of the screen and Yuri's on the right. The main objective here is to clear the area of cables and obstructions for the eventual installation of Node 2 and some fluid trays. The first task they work on is demating the Spitz power transfer cables. And next they'll disconnect eight cables that run between the pressurized mating adapter and the lab and they'll temporarily tie those off. After that, they demate connectors on the rigid umbilicals on each side of the lab, temporarily stowing them out of the way on the lab and other places. These need to be removed so that they're accessible once, node, uh, once fluid umbilical trays are installed on top of these during the stage after the node two move. Here, Peggy's working on some of those cables. During this time, Yuri will also be installing caps on his side of the lab to cap the receptacles left open by the PMA cable demates. And Peggy will also remove a light that will later be in the way of those trays. You can see it flashing here on the left. After the new trays are installed on top of these, the light can be reinstalled. Here's Peggy with the light headed to the airlock. Near where this handrail is flashing, Yuri will go up onto the truss and configure the port squib firing unit for deploy of the P1 outboard radiator, radiators. He also might loosen some bolts for the next flight while he's in the area if there's time. Next, they both head down to node two to remove the active common berthing mechanism cover. That's the ACBM cover. This cover's been protecting the sealing surface and mechanisms, but now it must be removed to allow the pressurized mating adapter to be berthed. The cover is held on by a strap that goes around the circumference. So after loosening the strap, they work together to bundle it up. And you can see at first here they're having it somewhat. Then they'll use wire ties to get the bundle fairly tight. And there's no right or wrong way to do this. Whatever it works, whatever works is what we're going to go with. And then the shroud will be taken back to the airlock where it can be put into the progress as trash. Next, Yuri travels back behind the Z1 truss almost to the Russian segment. And here he'll be taking an electrical out of the system in order to reconfigure a power system. And a similar task was done in the vicinity on STS-116. At the same time, Peggy will be performing a different configuration over in a starboard part of what we call the rat's nest. Here she'll be working with a power cable that was previously wire-tied on the s 0 tray. This is the general vicinity of the connectors. When she's done with the cables, she'll be retrieving a box called the baseband signal processor so it can be upgraded on the ground. She brings that into the airlock. And lastly, there's some bag and tool reconfigurations that are required to help shorten the stage EVAs that immediately follow this flight. They transfer tools between the bags and move a bag to the S0 truss. After the CVA, the station will be ready for removing the pressurized mating adapter and node two after the shuttle departs. <clears throat> Another EVA that you've been hearing about this morning is still in the approval process and it's dedicated to the testing of tile repair material. If approved, the CVA will be inserted between EVAs three and four and it will be performed by Scott Perzinski and Doug Wheelock. For this EVA, we chose our shuttle crew members who are already trained in tile repair. And we're glad to have Scott on board because he's been involved with the tile repair efforts since return to flight. For the most part, he'll be primed for, for performing the test, although um, I will say that we haven't worked out the exact choreography with he and Wheels. If approved, we'll call the spacewalk EVA-4 and the Peggy and Yuri EVA will be called EVA-5. We chose to insert this um, EVA rather than putting it at the end of the flight. Um, for a couple of reasons. First off, um, space, loot 
spacesuit logistics are a little bit easier um, because Scott and Wales are performing EVA-3. Uh, if they also perform EVA-4, then we don't need to swap uh, spacesuits in and out of the airlock as much. Um, and also, if for some reason um, we have the orbiter has to depart or we have some other contingencies, then um, that EVA-5, the Peggy-Urey EVA, can be deferred to the stage um, because Peggy and Urey are going to be there during this.